Welcome, everybody. Um, hope everybody had a good night. Hopefully, the evening wasn't too long. Um, why are we here today? Well, I'd like to give a bit of an overview of Qt Mobility. Um, there are a lot of APIs to cover, so I only have so much time. So what, I, what I'm going to do is I give a quick overview of what we have, in, what mobility APIs we have, and then I'm going to dive deep into some of the APIs. Um, I'm happy to answer any other questions um, at the end. And also, if there are an API that you're interested in um, that I haven't covered, and there are two mobility talks, um, then just come up, come to me and approach me and we'll go from there, I guess. So, a bit about myself. My name is Alex Blasche. I tro uh, joined Trolltech in 2004, and I have the pleasure of working in, in sunny Australia, Brisbane. And the Brisbane office is mostly involved in QML, declarative, Qt3D, and mobility development. And personally, um, I'm the tech lead for, the, for mobility development. So, What's mobility all about? Well, there are really five things which I would probably address here. First of all, it's, it's about addressing the mobile gap. Qt, as a standard Qt, as you may download it, has a lot of APIs and classes which pretty much work very well on all desktops and all, well, all platforms. Whether it's, be, it's mobile or desktop, doesn't really matter. Um, however, there are some categories which you traditionally don't find in, in desktop systems, and that's what the mobility program is all about, addressing the mobile gap um, in Qt. Um, and one of the things that um, one of the things that is, is, is very important to point out here is that although we trying to address the mobile gap. That does not mean by definition that it's not in theory possible to also port those APIs to the desktop platform. To give you a good example, um, a context API, for instance. A lot of application on, an, on, on, a mobile on my mobile phone or any kind of mobile device is likely to interact somehow with address books. Yes, it's also possible to do that on desktops without a problem. Um, the mobility program at this point focuses mainly on the on the desktop on the, on the mobile platforms, um, but we are open for, for instance, contributions. And there's nothing in in the book right now that says that it's not going to uh, be ported on desktop platforms as well. So while we're looking at mobile platforms in particular, we're trying to um, we're always ensuring that once the time comes, we can also easily port that to the desktops where possible. So there's definitely a, a, a use beyond mobile. Another thing that um, is quite, pre uh, quite, pre quite obvious in, uh, if you look at uh, Qt Mobility source tree is that we have out of the box QML support. What does that mean? Well, we're, we're basically delivering wrappers so that you can interact with every single mobility API from QML. You don't have to write a single piece of C++ code in order to um, make your QML-only application work. And of course, we will be giving the same compatibility statements which Qt gives. So once an API is released, it is pretty much frozen or we're guaranteeing the compatibility. And of course, um, mobility APIs will be available on pretty much all Nokia platforms coming out. So, there are a lot of mobility APIs, as I said earlier. The tentacles of mobility go quite far. Um, it's also a bit hard to really put a categorization on it, but I, I, I've tried to, to do that here. Three categories, consumer engagement, that's all the, I, I call it the, the funky things. Um, where users are immediately uh, noticing something um, you can interact in a direct way with the user. Then there are the data-driven APIs, 
well, contact stock gallery messaging organizer. They're basically operating on some sort of database. Um, you are you basically getting something out of the database, making changes to it, or basically retrieving this information in order to do something with the data. And then there are quite a few APIs which are infrastructure. Um, you may or may not come across them in, in your particular application. Um, some of them are actually quite well hidden these days. Others you may have to interact with. To give you an example, the bearer management, that's an API that just allows you to tell the system, well, I need internet, please bring it up for me. Um, if you are doing some very low level code, you're interacting directly with sockets, you're likely that you will require it. If you're, however, just interested in fetching some URL, then you may not even have to do that because bearer management has actually been integrated into Qt already. And if you use Q Network Access Manager, it will take care of all those kinds of things. So it will make sure that your device roams. It will make sure that the network comes up and the network goes down as soon as the application is done. So some of them you may encounter in your use cases. Some of them you may not. Now, the last category, well, future. We have a long roadmap. Um, I just picked two of the biggest ones, which are planned for mobility 1.2. So the, 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 the most recent release is mobility 1.1 beta. And the next release in summer next year will be mobility 1.2. The things we're looking here at are Bluetooth and NFC. For those of you who are not familiar with that, NFC is near field communication. Um, that's things like smart tag reading, RFID, uh, RFID uh, tags reading, as well as um, there are also other th smaller use cases like smart poster reading um, or ticketing. It's also a very interesting use case there. Or, as a matter of fact, pairing via Bluetooth. So devices go together. They exchange the keys for the pairing, and then Bluetooth from there on, Bluetooth goes on. Now, we have to, I have to ma had to make some decisions somewhere. What am I going to cover? Well, there are two mobility sessions. This one, um, and I've picked the service framework. I picked the data APIs, and in particular, I will go into the context here, but it may, could have been any other one of those data APIs. And I'm going to have a quick look into QML and how QML is integrated into the Qt Mobility APIs. In the second session, which is later today, I'm going to talk about um, location. Here in particular, you can really um, separate this into three different parts. Positioning, so GPS data, AGPS, maps, navigation, and a use case that's pretty much related to that is also geocoding. And last but not least, sensors. That will be part of the second presentation. Here I'm going to co concentrate on service framework data APIs, context and QML. Also, if you're interested in the multimedia section, there's also a multimedia presentation, um, I believe, in the next time slot. Next or the second next. OK. Let's talk about the service framework. Well, what is a service framework? Really, it's three things. It's a metadata store that basically describes a service, all its properties, attributes, etc. On top of that, you, you, in, in the same, you put into the same pod, you put Qt plugins, and you put an IPC component. And you mix that around, and you get a service, Qt service framework. Um, if you're familiar with the Qt plugin system, some of the things which are not quite as nice is the fact that you can't actually, it's very difficult to find the right plugin for your use case. Quite often you have to iterate over multiple plugins, instantiate them, see whether that's the one that you want, and then throw it out again if you don't need it, if that's not the one that you wanted. So the metadata improves that uh, to a degree that, based on the metadata, you know exactly what plugin you want to load, and you save some time there. The other part is a somewhat simplified IPC component. I guess what we're trying to do is, if you've ever done any Symbian IPC programming, it's not the nicest thing to do. Also, if you've then written your service in 
uh, in Symbian IPC and you want to actually bring that over to the MAMO platform, well, you have an entirely new platform there. Um, there's no Symbian IPC. The entire IPC component needs to be most likely DBus or some socket protocol. You have to do rewriting. Um, what does that give us in the end, the service framework? Well, you have kind of two two um, ways of looking at the service framework. It's a, it's a middleware component. You can have services plugging in underneath. So a lot of the Nokia um, applications will actually use that kind of customization mechanism where they will load services, which you may actually be able to extend. And then that will seemingly integrate into existing Nokia applications on the device, for instance. And you can look at it from the other, from the top, from the top perspective. Well, what services are there? Maybe I can make use of them to write my own application. Let's have a bit, have a look at an example. I've I've written down here a very very small service. Basically, what it does is it uh, allows the user to broadcast a message. It allows the user to, obviously on the other end, receive a message. And, well, I might I actually be able to also invoke the message. Whoops. The principle, the fundamental principle of a service in, in this architecture is something that is defined by the meta object. So any function that you might want to invoke or that you might want to use must be either a slot, a signal, a property, can be an enum, all the kinds of things that you can interrogate, in, in, can, can find out via QMeta object, which means that there isn't any interface that you derive from. It's pure code only. There's also no stuff that you have to send to the client. That's all done under the hood for you. That also means that, for instance, in this particular example here, the function print debug is not part of the interface contract because it's not actually, isn't marked as anything that is accessible via the meta object system. And service, the most basic service has three uh, attributes. It has a name, interface name. In this particular case, com Nokia Qt echo interface. It has a version, a major version and a binary version, uh, and, and, uh, and a minor version. The assumption here is that a major version change means that the interface has somehow been extended. It still needs to be binary compatible to the previous version. And the uh, minor version is kind of an implementation version that you might want to use. And then, of course, there's a service name. In addition to that, you can attach custom properties, um, which are mostly used to just find um, Simplify the search process. Okay. Assuming that we have the service somewhere hanging in the system, this pretty much describes how to find it and how to use it. There's an extensive class called QService Manager, which is the primary entry point from a client perspective. You find things, you ask for, you can set filters on it, describing what properties you want to filter up on, and you get a, essentially you get a list back of um, things that match your criteria. In this particular case, I've made it very simple. I just take the first one. Obviously, you can write much more sophisticated code here. The one, one thing that I could, for instance, imagine is that you actually present a choice to the user. If you find several services, let's say, an email service, one for an implementation for Google Mail, one for Nokia Mail, one for my exchange. Or you ask the user, which one do you want to use? Or, in fact, integrate it into your application such that it uses multiple ones. What do we get back? Once I've found the, the service that I want to use, I'll just load it. And what I get is a Q object pointer. That's all I get. And that's why it's important that everything that you do is described via the meta object. And then you can pretty much use it like any other, um, you can use it with a standard connect statement. And where it becomes 
uh, and if you then want to invoke something, you obviously need to go to the meta object and tell it, please invoke that function here. The advantage here is that although the invoke method is actually quite, well, it's not a nice function call as such. The principle here is that that is likely not to be an API that you offer to a client. It's supposed to be infrastructure, so it allows you to, for instance, have no type dependencies on the service. You can just, you don't need to know anything. No includes that are anywhere hanging around. If you want to have a client API around that, it's likely that you would have to put one on top. Okay. I briefly sp uh, spoke about the the client side of things already. So essentially, as a service manager, it allows you to register, look up services, and invoke them once you've found them. Under the hood, the service framework itself has the three components. There's the metadata store, which contains description, the service attributes, properties, etc. And now we have two choices. What's my service? It could be a plugin, or my service could actually be hanging around in a different process. Mobility 1.0, introduce the plugin-based service. So there will be uh, Nokia applications which actually use uh, that plugin infrastructure to and, uh, allow, uh, and therefore allow you to, for instance, extend um, by providing your own plugins which are adhering to certain interfaces. And in that particular case, it's not mo no, no more else than just loading that plugin by the plugin system. And it's pretty much the object is forwarded to you as a client. The second option here is that your service is actually, so a service object is instantiated in a different process. And this is where the abstraction comes in with regards to IPC. Obviously, depending on your platform, you may, you may have to use Symbian IPC. In the case of Linux platforms, or all Linux platforms, as a matter of fact, uh, it's DBus. Um, there's also the possibility, of course, to, there's a fallback as well, which is the local socket implementation um, that is pretty much working anywhere where Qt is working. Our message in this case here is the Symbian IPC. This is how ha splitting up the IPC component a bit further. Obviously, underneath, we always use the native platform IPC component. On top of that sits a message layer, which pretty much takes care of the abstraction towards the platform. That's um, some arbitrary protocol. In the case of DBus, obviously, it's a well-known protocol. Um, in fact, you could even do something like uh, having your client or your service written with the Qt service framework, and you could then find that service on the DBus and can actually inter interact on the client side with the service as well. You don't need to actually have a Qt based client here. It's sending on the DBus. Now, I mentioned earlier that there is no stop going on forwards and backwards, so the client doesn't actually need to know anything about the service. And in order to achieve that, um, the IPC component ki kind of takes the object on the service side, asks for the meta object, serializes that meta object, and sends it over the wire when the service is requested. And on the other side, that ob meta object is basically reinstantiated and just attached to a normal queue object. So essentially you have a queue object pointer that is not of the type that the service actually is, but its meta object looks exactly the same as the one of the type on the other end. That's why you can't do things like casting. It doesn't work. Whereas in a, in a plugin based case, you might actually be able to do that because the plugin is loaded in the same process, the type information is pretty much there. So if you have the header available, you could, in theory, cast as well. It's possible. And then th that proxy object, which has now that meta object from the service, is what is returned to, to the client. And you can just poke it now with a QMeta object calls, which I invoke method or just ordinary connect calls. This also shows you, then it's really up to you as, as a client or as a matter of fact, as a service provider to decide what kind of protocol you want to use. So you might be able to say, well, I, I'm after an asynchronous protocol. 
I'll just send a message and at some stage it comes back. What you choose in that case is probably a slot, single slot kind of scenario. Send, invoke a slot on the, on the other side, and when that thing is done, it will send a signal to me back. If you're after something that's synchronous, you can use that as well. If, you're, if you have an invocable function, which was vi pretty much visible uh, in, the, in that case here, the last message is actually an invocable function. It returns something. And because it's not void, the client will actually block on that call till it comes back from the service. <coughs> so on a, on a conceptually, on the, top, on the top layer of the protocol, all you see really is you connect your, uh, your signals and slots the way you would do in any, uh, any other pro uh, in any other application. The only difference is that your signal and slot connection is actually going cross-process boundaries. And the nice thing here is you really, you take, you implement your service object. If you're a service implementer, you provide your service object and you just port it to the other side, uh, to, to, the, to the next platform. And there's nothing more to do for you to do. All the IPC stuff is taken care of. Now, there are a couple of, um, this is now the service side. So it's assuming that you have that object that I showed, that echo service that I showed earlier, um, you have that declared somewhere in your service. The next thing you really do is then getting yourself a service or a remote service register. And you basically tell the service register, I have this class here, in my case, the echo service class. I would like to have that published under the name echo service. It's implementing this interface here with that version. That's what the first, the second line there really is. And then I have a couple of additional things which do not really apply to the plugin. In the case of a plugin, you load it in the same process and you're the one who has an instance of that service object, you are on, you are on your own. So nobody else uses that instance. In the case of IPC uh, services, you have a couple of more options here. You could potentially say, okay, the service always brings up returns an instant a reference to the inst to the same instance on the service in the service process. So that's the concept of I guess a global instance. Every new request for the service will return a reference to the same instance of the service object. Whereas on the other hand you could also think that you could also imagine that every new client request, those guys get a new instance. They have a private instance so to say. And that's what I'm doing here in the third line. I'm setting the instantiation type. It's really up to the service implementer to to distinguish or to to make that kind of call. And in this particular case, it's a global instance, which means every new client request gets a reference to the same echo service object. Essentially, what, another option that you actually can do here as well is you could say, run the second line and the third line again using the same echo service, but set a different instantiation type. Obviously, you would have to sort of um, change something in the triplet there that of, that of what the service is, like presumably you might change it, call it um, an echo service that private echo service or something. Because obviously everybody gets a new instance. A kind of shared service that is always a pr private instance doesn't really make sense, but nevertheless. Which means the same, the same, what I'm trying to say is that the same class, the same service class can be used in both ways at the same time. And last but not least, once you've set all the, f the funky options that um, might be of interest for the service, you just register it and uh, basically you publish it. Um, the string there is basically the ID that is used then to look it up either on the dbus or in the case of Symbian IPC, that's the, um, the, the Symbian IPC ident, or in the case of a local socket, that's basically just the, the socket name. Let's pass to key local socket. Okay, let's have a look at this. What I'm going to do here now is I have an example of exactly that echo service. And I'm bringing, I have two clients. Both clients, by default, connect to the, I have 
essentially I have two binaries on my hard drive. I have two ins I'm, I'm, I executed the echo client twice, and I have a, another another process, another binary on my hard drive, which is started as soon as these echo clients request something. In this particular case, up and start up, they both um, they're both starting in the shared chat mode, so they're both connect talking to the same binary on the hard drive. Um, let's say this one here is Alex, and this one here over here is Otto. Uh, Otto. Now, Otto is sending a, a message now. And essentially what's happening under, under, underneath is that Otto is invoking um, a broadcast signal. It's emitting a signal. And that goes to the binary, uh, to the to service. And the service then, sorry, Otto is sending the message, of course. And then the service will broadcast that back to everybody. So this guy got the message from the service. And this one guy got the message from the service. Now, what you can do is, of course, change one of those guys into a private mode. So now he gets his own instance of the same service. He's still connected to the global one as well. But at the moment, he's by himself. As you can see there, it's only him receiving it. Of course, if I go let this guy here, send something, or still receive it. At this point in the service object, in, in the service process, you have two instances of this echo service. You have the one that's shared between the two and the private one that's just for, the, for Alex. Obviously, you can do the same thing over here. At this point now, we have three instances of the service. And he's talking by himself. And I can obviously change backwards and forwards as I see fit. Obviously, the, only the global instance really makes sense in a shed kind of scenario. You can make up your own mind as to how useful a shed service is for myself in a private instance. Yeah. Uh, can we have a microphone? Uh, does this mean that um, it's also working between uh, machines over the network? Or is no. At this point, it's using IPC, inter-process communication. Yes, it's conceivable that you can ha actually implement something like this across machine boundaries as well. Um, I've, had, I've seen requests for that, and I'm certainly open to that. But at this point, it's, it's using some kind of local IPC, so DBus, local socket, or Symbian IPC. I guess the main thing ta to take away from that is it becomes very simple to really pr uh, write your own IPC uh, component here. Um, while I'm not, uh, not arguing how, about the complexity of Dbus, I definitely can uh, recommend if you, ever, if you have not written Symbian IPC and you look at that and Symbian IPC, I tell you this is probably magnitudes easier to do. Um, everything is taken care of it for you. As a matter of fact, um, even kinds of, uh, you might even have uh, scenarios where you say, okay, well, I have a service here, but the service is rather sensitive. Um, maybe a payment service or some ticketing service. I want to make sure that nobody else connects to me unless I approve of prove so. Yeah, assuming IPC, DBAS have, 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 uh, have methods that allow you to do that as well. So. Um, in Symbian IPC, you can actually inquire who's connecting to me. Is that guy? Does that guy have a, has a UID that that, that I recognize, um, or does he have some other security token? My, for instance, a vendor ID. In the case of Dbus, and as a matter of fact, local socket, similar principle applies. Although the data structures that you handle are slightly different, there you will get things like process IDs, group IDs. Um, 
pretty much what you can find out via a normal um, Unix style socket connection, as long as you have this so the, f the file descriptor for it. Okay, so we have these two types of services, and they're conceptually they're two. They're slightly different in, in 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 what you can do and what you can't do with them. In the case of a plugin, um, you get your unique service object instantiation. The next guy gets another instance of it. In the case of IPC, you really can distinguish between you really can distinguish between global and private instances. Um, there are also a couple of limitations in the IPC case. Presu presumably, you could write a service which in turn returns another Q object pointer, or that returns let's say, a QWidget pointer. That does not work. So you can't have a QWidget instance in one service wanting to wire that over, the, over to the other process and going to, it's not going to work. The, the widget belongs to, and then in the graphic context, that the widget belongs to, belongs to the service process. So only the first level of Q object can really be wired, which means you have some limitations with your types. In general, Value types. That's what you can go can go forwards and backwards. Nothing that's a Q object kind of the right thing. That's what I mean here when I say single level um, object. If I can find a mouse. And yeah, as I mentioned earlier, security checks are possible. The things which are common to both implementations are obviously the ability for you to implement your synchronous or asynchronous behavior as you see fit, and you don't have any stops. There's no stub whatsoever, meaning there's no type dependency. Not even it doesn't even have to be a link dependency. And in the case, and in, in both cases, you basically when you request the service, you load the service. If the service process isn't started, the system will make sure that it's started. So then, and then you can talk to it. That's a quick introduction into the service framework. Data-driven APIs. Well, those data-driven API, there are five of them at the moment in Qt Mobility. The, the new ones in Qt Mobility 101 are Document Gallery and Organizer and, and Landmarks. So, and it's conceptually, they all do the same thing. I insert or create an entry into, the day, into my metadata store. I select it. I'm, I'm asking for it. There's some filter options, request. I can update the de details for, for, for one of those entries, and essentially I can delete one. Obviously, the main difference here is they all handle some other types of entries or, or details or issues, whatever you want to call it. In the case of context, it's an address book entry. Um, everything connected to, to your address book. In fact, um, the address, the, the context API, as, as you see it there, is also what's used to implement the address book on the devices. Doc gallery, yeah, albums, documents, folders, images, playlists, you name it. Landmarks, that's all about points of interest. So you might might think a good example, for instance, is that I don't I, don't, I download the I don't know, the location of all red light cameras in the vicinity. I put that into my navigation device. There's the import and export function, there's import and export functionality. It's put on the device into the database. So ev it's available to every client. Yep. Uh, the points of interest, can you sort of store sets of points of interest to sort of have a line as a point of interest? Or a line? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's something more, more than one-dimensional points of interest. Um, can you group them together in any way? So yes, you can have categories. Um, as to in general, if you have like a really large building, that would still be just one point of interest. So I guess you would have to make a pick somewhere. In general, it's a coordinate. A GPS coordinate that's attached to it. The uh, I was thinking like a track, 
or a route or a Okay, well, that in that area, we are talking now about maps, navigation, that kind of stuff. Right. That's a slightly different API again. This is pure points of interest, a single point somewhere, a dot on the map. Okay, that's all thanks. it is. But yes, that's also part of mobility, just a different API. In the case of messaging, yep, anything that you might actually conceive as something going back forwards and backwards in terms of messaging. SMS, email, instant messaging is coming, MMS. And organizer, well, that's pretty much the other side of the context API, any, any other thing that you might consi consider as important on a, on a PIM device, on a PIM context, personal information management context, journals, to-dos, events, that kind of stuff. What's common among all those uh, elements is really that they operate on a common metadata uh, um, store, so to say. So you, in each case, you will uh, when you when you make a when you make a change to the to the to the if you add something or you remove something, it will always be a global a, a global um, action. So if you add, uh, remove the address, an entry from the address book, it will remove it for all applications. There's also the possibility that you have, in some cases, your own local store, which you might actually want to pull in as well. That's not, that's not available with all APIs, but in any case, you will always operate, always have the option to operate on a global store. Obviously, you want to interact with that. You have synchronization. Me mechanisms, you have notification mechanisms, something was being added by a different process, for instance. Um, and you can, of course, group them, categorize them by whatever is the appropriate categorization for a particular API. So it might be a category in the case of landmarks or everybody who's connected to, everybody who's connected, for instance, to um, a particular album on the hard drive in the case of a, of a, of a doc gallery, etc. And API naming is sort of the principles used on the APIs with regards to filtering, requesting. Most of the functions are same, where there are only slight details, where, and they usually are due to the particular um, differences of a particular API. So it would probably be boring if I go to every single API here that's data-driven. So I just picked one, contacts. It has, as I mentioned earlier, it operates on a data store. In the case of, of context, you can actually have multiple data stores on the device. SIM card might be a data store. Um, the global address book on the phone might be a data store. You might even be able to just, you can just even create your own. And you can then in any way or shape even combine those two in your application if you like to. But essentially, you have a manager object, contact manager, one manager object per data store. You need to synchronize between those if you have multiple ones of those. And essentially, they all talk about have some number of contexts in it. And contexts can have relationships. So, and the relationship, the type of the relationship is really arbitrary. It could be my spouse, it could be my friend. The API basically leaves it up to you to define what the relationship is really is. It's just an arbitrary relationship that you can define. And of course, e every single contact has details. Email address, phone number, work phone number. Think of an every detail you probably will find. It's somewhere in the API. You can even define your new details on top of those. And in fact, each detail can e some details can even have multiple instances. So for instance, you could have a thumbnail attached to a particular person. You can actually have multiple thumbnails attached to the same person as well. So it might an interesting use case here, for instance, for an op from an operator perspective might be, well, okay, I want to make sure that all the contacts which are on my particular network, T-Mobile, name it, whoever, they get a certain thumbnail to attitude so that the user can immediately see, ah, oh, this is actually a guy that's sitting in t uh, on my home network, T-Mobile, because I get special rates. You can make up a use case here. So in addition to that, of course, that person might actually have a thumbnail or a picture attached to it as well, because I took a, a picture of him, which is actually what might be shown on my address book. So any arbitrary details you can attach to it. A part that's also new in context now with, uh, with Mobility 101, you can actually define actions. 
So what's an action? Somebody says, I have this phone number over there, the work phone number, and I want to uh, do something with it. I want to send it via Bluetooth. I want to send it to a printer. I want to save it as an additional contact detail with another detail. So there's a concept of an action factory. You define what kind of actions you're after. You get an action back. And then you define the target for that action. And a target usually is a contact. And in particular, you could even say a detail, a particular detail in the contact. That's an addition in the 101. Um, mobility API and that action factory is, is, is a good example of, an, of a use case where the service framework is used. You can actually create new action types. So in the, in the context API will pick them up. There's a particular interface that you need to impl implement. And you define your arbitrary actions, which then make it through the clients on the device. The Nokia applications will see it. Everybody see it, who has some interest in actions. Some of the things which are very common among all the data APIs are the request kind of infrastructure. You have a manager. You create a type of request. In this particular case, here I'm mentioning fetch and save. The types of, of requests are somewhat specific to the data API, but essentially they're all somewhere in the same category. And you take that request, go to the go to the manager object for that particular data API, data API in the particular in this particular case it's the contact manager and it will come back asynchronously to you and telling you well here's your reply it's very much what you may, may know already from Q network access manager same principles here reply object comes back to you yeah and that F, such a request can have multiple things like progress notification um, if it fails it gives you an error back Etc. Last, I'd like to talk a bit about QML and mobility. Official support for QML in mobility uh, was added or will be added in Qt Mobility 101 now. Every single API where it makes sense will have a QML API as well. Why am I saying that makes sense? Note I'm mentioning almost all APIs. Um, some use cases, it just doesn't, isn't really useful. I'll give you an example. The bearer management API does not have, a, at least at this point, a QML wrapper. If you see a good use case, I'm all eager to hear it and we'll add it. But at the moment, I don't really see a real good use case. Who would want to bring up the network from within, within QML? The most likely case that is that you're getting yourself a Q-Network Access Manager, which in turn internally already takes care of all that kind of stuff. And your QML application doesn't really need to know about it. Of course, if you do some kind of socket programming in your QML, well, if you do that, then you probably have some C++ code behind your QML anyway, because it's, I'm not actually aware of any QSocket programming examples in pure QML, it's, as far as I know, it's possible. There was a question? Oh, yeah. Hang on, uh, microphone. Uh, now there is BR manager in the Qt 4.7. Mm -hmm. There is BR manager in 1.1, and sometimes it's not compatible. And okay. usually, even if you try to compile your example on 4.7, you mm -hmm. will get some warning. And I did an example. I tried to uh, compile um, weather info application uh, application example yep. in 4.7 and I got some warning about you okay. need to change implementations your applications yep. to be compatible with 4.7 okay. yep. so in this particular case for all who don't know that yet um, their management was introduced for mobility 1.0 but it was such a essential use case for Qt it was basically added to Qt 4.7 as well the API is source compatible. Obviously, it's not binary compatible because we're obviously changing already the library. It's moving into a different library, in this particular case, Qt Network. Now, that's one of the reasons why, for instance, Qt Mobility is in its own namespace. If you're using the, uh, the bear management in Qt, it is the one without namespace. If you're using the one in Mobility, it's the one with namespace. And then as in your project file, you basically select 
do I want the bear from mobility or do I want the bear from cute? And the official, and essentially, the bear management in, in Qt 4.7 is the one going forward. That's the one we will continue to extend or maintain, etc. The one in bear is mostly for the Qt 4.6 use cases. So if you have a device that's 4.6 on it, like for instance the N8, it ships with bear, for, but it's a 4.63 device. So the library will continue to exist. You can use it. You've, the warning is basically there to tell you that, well, you might actually want to change over to the other API. But essentially, the, 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 the source code, uh, the, the, the source from a source compatibility point of view, it's the same API. There are a couple of reasons why I encourage you to do that as well, because the entire network access manager bring up, bring down kind of scenario, you will not be able to use with the bare API from mobility. Because obviously it can't, it sits outside of the stack. It can't a in, interact with the insides of Q Network Access Manager. You will have to do your own basic roaming, for instance, scenarios on top of that. So the warning is really there to encourage you to have a look at the new thing. And it's very simple to write that. In fact, you could even write applications that, um, where you could, you could write code such that, well, if it's a 4.6 based device, in my project file, I will link against good mobility bearer. If it's a 4.7 device, I'll be linked against Qt Network. And you have a couple of lines that you have to change in your source code. Another thing where the QML kind of scenario influenced uh, mobility is um, in the API design. Like, uh, the, the most... The easiest way to integrate, uh, integrate, interact with C++ in QML is having some Q objects. Q objects are immediate, and its, it's slot signals are accessible. Once they're actually made uh, available via QML context, you can immediately call their slot signals, connect to it, etc. And that has, influ that has influenced the APIs on the Qt mobility side. You have two options if you want to uh, adopt your API for QML usage. You can either write a wrapper where you essentially write a new API on top of the C++ API to make it useful for QML users, or you make the entire CPA, uh, C++ API available straight to QML. Well, why would you want to do the first, but not the, well, why would you not want to write everything immediately available for QML in such a, the reason is that Value types is, is a very good reason why you may not want to, why, why you may want to use a, uh, utilize a wrapper. Um, value types aren't easily accessible from QML because they're not Q objects. By definition, there's some value type which you can copy around, etc. And in the such cases, you do actually need a wrapper to make your value type accessible to QML. Whereas if you have an object that is already kind of a value type that's a Q object, uh, which is kind of not a Q value type at all anymore because it's really an identity and you can't really copy it, then you can put it, pretty much put it straight into QML. A good example of that is the Census API. The Census API has solved the problem of um, making it available via Q object pointers. It gives you a Q it gives you a sensor reading back, which is a pointer of a to a Q object, uh, but the pointer is always reused. Hence, whenever the reading changes, the object changes internally, and you get a reading changed update. In the case of contacts, it's slightly difficult. Um, it's predominantly value type with lots of information, and you might actually copy them around, sync them, and compare them, etc. And that is inherently very difficult with Q objects. Very easy to get memory leaks there as well. So, some of the APIs are very easily accessible for, uh, from QML pretty much the same. Other APIs really do need wrappers. And the mobility wrappers basically take care of that conversion. So here's actually the, the example that I was talking about. There's a class called Q Orientation Sensor. It's exactly the same guy as the one on, this, on the slide here. We're, we're, we're activating it on the, on the we're, pro, uh, we're activating the sensor, and we basically get an on-reading change signal back. and as the, the parameter that, that we get back is a reading. And then you can basically interrogate, well, what was the content of that reading? And, well, otherwise it's just saying unknown. I don't know what this is all about. 
And here is pretty much a, one of the simplest way of really converting that kind of uh, QML that you see over there into C++ code. There's no, like in theory you could even deploy QML file only to, uh, to the device, but they're not really a binary as such. So you would require a QML viewer, let the user browse to the QML file that you start, you can do that. But most likely you wanna just hook your QML file up into the application list. So most likely you will have a binary, very simple one like this one. That's what we usually do for all our embedded examples. They have some main function just to make the deployment process easier. And how does that look like? Well, this creates quite a, quite a bit of a chain with regards to what plugin is loading what, et cetera, et cetera. So in this particular case, we have an orientation QML, which I showed on the previous page. It's loaded by the main CPP. And it had, maybe I should go backwards, it had that import statement here, Qt Mobility Sensors 101. And that will basically trigger the loading of the declarative sensors wrapper for QML. And that wrapper in the, particular, in the case of sensors is very easy. It's basically just registering the, the real Q sensor, um, Q orientation sensor to, to the uh, QML context. In other cases, it's more sophisticated. And it of course, oops, and it of course pulls in the sensors library. Of course, they're all linked against declarative library anyway because they require that. Presumably, in particular on a desktop, this might actually be a conceivable approach. Um, you could obviously replace the main with a QML viewer, but essentially the entire dependency chain is built up from, from your QML file onwards. An interesting use case here, if you to have, for instance, um, a service framework enabled um, QML use case. What that will actually do is um, it will pull in the, the service framework QML plugin. Obviously it's linking against the same declarative library. It itself will pull in the Qt service framework, which in turn then will pull in the next plugin, possibly your service. And you can make build quite a long chain of plugins, loading plugins, plugins, loading plugins, etc., depending on your use case. So be aware of that. That's pretty much it for me. Um, the second session will be on about uh, navigation, routing, positioning, and sensors. I will dive, dive deeper into those APIs. If you're interested, come along. I'm open for questions. Yes, I have a few questions um, to the service framework. The first question was, uh, I didn't understand the other question. Was this about uh, going over the network? Is this also possible with the service framework? Yes, that was the question. That was the other question, yes. yes uh, I didn't understand it. That was the question, but no, that's not possible okay, at this stage. Yeah. Um, the other one is, um, if, if I have a service that no, has no global instance, how is the service created in, this, in the server? There must because so you have a service that's a private instance okay then okay it's only one instance that is always private for, for no no app. you can have if you have your service which is marked as private which means every client request will get a new instance of that service class and if you have five clients connecting to the same service um, you get five instances you have and it's five always using the default constructor or how does it yes, work? Yes, and this video, it always uses a default constructor. Okay. That's one requirement that you have. Okay. Otherwise it can't instantiate it and find it. And the last one is um, uh, there were a problem with this uh, Qt Mobility um, namespace when connecting signals that always have to do a type def if you don't want to import uh, the header file in, in another header file. Is there any other solution to this or? So you're talking about the case that you have a connect statement and you need to. Yes, right. That yeah. the signature, the signature signatures different. are different. Yes, that's a well-known problem. Uh, it's basically a limitation in mock. Um, it's, there's no solution at this point. Okay. You have to be, do a bit, bit of magic there. So always yeah. type devs. Yeah. Okay, that was all. Thank you.
There are also some macros that you can use to just put it in front in case. So you should have a look at the examples in Qt Mobility. They have a lot of those use cases, and it's likely that you will find a, a solution or some example of it. And I have a, a small more service questions. Uh, if you uh, register the service from your application, it will. Is it true that it will be registered throughout the system, or I should do a, a separate application to do? Okay, so from a deployment perspective, it's slightly different from a platform to platform. Um, in particular, assuming it's the odd man out here. Essentially, what you want is up on deployment, you want to register that service. The, reg the service description is, is an XML file. My answer, uh, on all platforms but Symbian, what you do is to, uh, there's, a, there's a service framework um, tool, it's a command line tool. Um, it's called service FW, which allows you, to, it takes the XML file and it basically puts that to the, to the database. It registers it. So um, the most likely way of making your service known to the system is up on deployment, you just run that command line tool, which is part of obviously the the service framework package, which would, which would have been installed to the system pre prior to that, presumably via some dependency chain. And then from there you go. It's known to the system. In the case of Symbian, it's slightly different. Um, it's very tricky to, um, to install, to have a binary running up on syspackage installation. And yes, it is possible in theory, uh, but you need insane capabilities for that. So there is a... There's a, se a second mechanism for, for doing that. That was introduced in Qt Mobility 101, whereby you basically just drop the XML file into a certain directory on the hard drive, which is basically the service framework database manager. So when you, require, when you request a, um, a service, it will actually do an underneath go to the database manager for the service framework, ask it for it all details, it operates on the database and comes back to you. And the service database process will also monitor that particular uh, pro, um, directory. It's sort of similar to some of the theming things. But it, it's an imports directory that it monitors for. Okay, and the second second question is, can I use the service to wake my application? For example, I have uh, an infinite loop inside that checks some web service, and then when uh, some data changes happen, um, I want that my, my application to be uh, wake and, and uh, notify the users that you have some new updates. So you want the service waking up the client process. Uh, that's not possible at this point. Okay. But uh, are there uh, well, the Symbian APIs that I... We can well, it's, it's, uh, it's fundamental. In general, the, 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 the direction is the other way. You have a client wants to get something from a service and so the, the IPC mechanism is such that it wakes up the service. Uh, it's the same in the DBus co context. Um, you have the client, DBus wakes up the, the API, the, the, the process that provides your particular DBus interface. And that's what we're utilizing here as well. It doesn't work the other way around. No. Okay. So, you, so at most what you can do is you basically put your process, you connect to the signal that possibly gives you your notification that you're looking for and you have to wait. Yeah. B at yeah, least you don't you. have to busy loop. Okay, thank you. Uh, when the mobility 1.1 will be released? When? Yeah. Uh, very soon, within the next weeks or so. Oh, okay. okay. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could go back to uh, the slide where um, you have the server code for uh, the uh, service manager. Um, uh, there was one thing I didn't grasp. Um, you had a published entries, so you can have multiple entries registered under one name. This uh, one? Yeah, exactly. SFW Echo Service. Uh, in this example, you have one service, one, I mean, one entry. Yeah. Um, wh what's the use case for multiple entries with uh, the client code is actually going to search using the, 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 the name that's down there, SW, SFW Echo Service, or will it use... Uh, so all the services yeah. in this particular case you yeah. can have multiple services actually. In this particular case, I only have one service, my echo service. Um, they can all provided by the same binary, and they can they will all be basically published under the same uh, address here. S service okay. framework, a, a service 
framework echo underscore service. But you can, it, then when up on the client connecting, it will tell it, well, I'm actually after the echo service with, the, with that interface and that implementation version, and then the system will work out which class to instantiate or may just return the object in the case of a global instance. Okay, sorry, thank you very much. Uh, two questions. Uh, one question is about binary compatibility. Currently, 1.1 beta version is not compatible on the Simbian platform. Do you know about this? Um, there is an incompatibility in the, um, in the context API. Uh, but, uh, I don't remember exactly because I'm from integration team and we tried to use 1.1 <coughs> beta and just compiled and run on the Simbian 4 port platform and it's not uh, yep, supported. The reason now. is. Um, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's due to the MCL integration for Symbian. They f at the end, what matters is what is, was released on uh, with mobility 1.0x and what would be 1.1x. Uh -huh. uh, what happened here was that within the development from one, between 1.0 and 1.1, um, a sync was done with other services, service and other code lines, which was then uh, subsequently due to API reviews being removed. Mm -hmm. So. You basically have some incompatible view that was some, at some stage a uh, development version, a particular development version which was reviewed. And because during the development process of every API, we review constantly. So as long as the API is not uh, released till 1.0, 1.1, uh, we will not make any guarantees. If you get a snapshot of, of Guitarius, yeah. it's always going to be, it may break. And second question is about supporting on the MIGO platform. Because I couldn't compile uh, by default because a multimedia component is not supported in the current release of the Mingo platform. Okay, so how is it possible? And will you support uh, mobility API on the Mingo platform? Okay, especially one. So let one. me refine that question. When you say Mingo platform, what are you talking about? Are you talking about Hamilton or are you talking about what's going to be Mingo.com? Mingo.com. Okay, uh, Mingo.com. So some of the APIs already work on uh, Mingo.com. Um, not all of them yet. Not all of them have a working backend yet. That's something that we're working on. Because, so the question, um, what, what was said here is that there is a memo.5 and memo6 configure option, but there is no Migo one yet. Yes, mobility.1.1 is not um, is not entirely supporting all Migo.com components yet. That's something that will be handed handed down further down the road. Um, one question about the push services. Um, I'm, I'm not so good in, uh, in, uh, in the Symbian platform, so my question is, if I want to port a, uh, an application which uh, receives push services for, for, from a server, for example, to, to update a list of notification, is this possible in, in Symbian? to have a, a service, a client service on your phone, which uh, receives push notification from a server. For example, sending an updated list of notifications, or this is one case. So you have a service? You have an application uh, installed on your phone. L let's, say, uh, let's say it's a banking application, yep. and you have a notification list, for example, you have, to, you have some due, due payments. Um, and the server is sending a, a push notification because this is possible in the other platform. Is this possible also in, in Symbian to, to, to have a service which, um, uh, which is not really listening because this, this will be a battery consuming, memory consuming and so on, but just um, be able to receive a notification. So I don't have an, a TCP uh, connection with the server, a uh, continuous uh, TCP connection. Okay, so. Uh, as I said, the service framework has, at this point, nothing to do with um, cross-machine kind of interaction. Um, all that is is two processes communicating to each other on the same system. So if you have your service binary talking to then some TCP kind of thing, in, 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 or the banking server in your case, um, then presumably if there's some TCP notification coming in, it would could forward that to the clients via the service framework in, uh, internals. That's part of your service implementation, so to say. Um, but there is no, that was sort of similar to the question that, that came down here. There is no notification backwards from the, well, the service, ca service process cannot 
invoke the client. It only works the other way around. So the client needs to go first to the service and then wait for, uh, hook up to the connect signal for whatever signal you're providing in the service and then wait for it to act. Okay, in fact, the question is not about uh, internal services. So I'm speaking about an external push of a notification to the phone. For example, um, some kind of service can inform your phone you have new emails. So this is a push notification. Uh, but not internally between two services. I understand the difference. It's okay, so clear. in that particular case, in case of the email, ca uh, email case, for instance, where a mail comes in, what you probably want to use is the email, um, the, the messaging API, because it provides uh, push notifications uh, or notifications about any kind of incoming message to you. Uh, uh, when will the APIs be available for uh, uh, USB notification or something when the user has plugged in a USB or a low battery notification so that we do appropriate application? Uh, for example, I'm using a camera. I'm writing a camera application. If it's a r low battery, I don't want to, you know, uh, turn on the viewfinder or not allow the camera application to run. So such kind of notifications. Yeah. So that kind of notification would... Um, I'm not the expert in multimedia, but uh, I would ex ex expect that to be part of the multimedia API for camera. Um, there is, this has not really anything to do with the service framework at itself. This is for, for presumably some platform API notification. Something like a future API which we are expecting. On Sorry? A future API, not just camera use case, yep. I'm just, that's one use case. Yep. Something like when the U USB is connected or system notifications basically. Yep. Um, I, I acknowledge there are myriads of system notifications. Um, some of them you might find in the system information API. Your particular case you will not find. It's not there yet. As I said, there is a long, long list of feature requests. Thanks. Um, would it be possible to extend this service framework um, for uh, remote uh, going over over the network, maybe to write a plugin that uh, does the same thing like DBus or something like this? Okay, so yes and no. Um, no in so far that the service framework itself at the moment, the library abstracts all the, the IPC components away. So in order to add that feature on that, on that level, um, there's no plug-in system for that. You would have to, we would have to change the library itself. Um, the, what you could do in such a case is that you actually utilize the plug-in mechanism, where then the plug-in itself abstracts away the communication to, to the remote entity, and then you offer that service via your local plug-in interface. Okay. Uh, yeah. But that's, I mean, that's a workaround. It's okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. If there are no other questions, um, or if you do have questions later on, come to me, grab me. Otherwise, have a nice day.